Welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> Today, uh, we're going to do a continuation of um, continuing to uh, work on the 1911 government model frame that in the last video, we fitted the Colt 22 long rifle conversion unit, uh, the slide. So, um, the next step I did after completing the slide, of course, was getting all the die come off. And I made plugs, which you'll see a lot clearer um, when we go to do the electroless nickel finishing, which is going to be our main project. Um, so you get to see how that's done. It's very simple. Um, I'm going to do it in our kitchen. I'd do it in the garage if I had a propane stove out here, but I don't, so we're going to go in the kitchen. Um, electroless nickel is a process that uh, prior to the early 1980s was used a lot in the marine, the marine industry uh, for plating tools, like wrenches and, and oh, any hand tools that would have been used uh, in a harbor or boat, boating situation. Um, then as stainless steel got better, the alloys of stainless steel got more friendly to machining, there was no more need for the electroless nickel. And that kind of holds true in the firearms industry as well, because in the early 80s, it was very popular. I had worked for a, uh, a large uh, firearms manufacturer after I graduated from Colorado School of Trades. And uh, that was like early 1983. And I introduced the electroless nickel to them because I had seen how it was done and did it when I was in school. And I actually did it to a 1911 frame of, of one of my guns I owned and uh, showed it to them. And they played around with it a little bit. They liked it and they started using it on some of their more popular firearms and it worked out fantastic. It was a, a great, great way to protect your rifle. If you were hunting up in Alaska or a wet environment, you really didn't have to worry about uh, rusting issues. Um, now that stainless steel alloys are so much better and more machinable, of course, uh, E-Nickel has fallen by the wayside. I still like it. Um, I think it's neat that you can do that to your own firearms. You can do this in your own home and you'll have all the protection of stainless steel um, or almost just as good. And you've also making, you're making the firearm look fantastic. So I'll show you the 45 uh, government model uh, command. It's actually a commander that I did. And I'll show you that next. So here is the combat commander that I uh, uh, made as a gunsmithing school project at CST. And I had actually um, purchased this from another student at the time. Um, he was hard up for money and I always wanted one. So yeah, why not? So this was a standard combat commander and uh, what I've done to it, some I've, many of the things that are just custom features, uh, you saw stoning, honing, fitting of the slide. And that's a case where you would peen down, as I showed you in the prior video, the top of the slide, tighten everything up and then come back and hone it into position so it's nice and uh, tight, smooth slide action. Uh, it has Smith & Wesson K-frame sights that were installed. And that was because I wanted to make this a carry gun. And the front sight is one that was made in school. Very low profile. Because once you bring these sights down this low, you don't get much of a front sight. And you don't want anything to snag. But back in the day, there really wasn't much choice for a, an adjustable sight. Uh, you had Bowman sights and maybe millet. 
And, you know, if you're hurting for money and you needed something on the cheap, you could always find yourself a Smith & Wesson uh, K-frame uh, site and uh, put it on. Of course, you had to have a mill and fill your dovetail, mill it out properly. Um, came out very nice and uh, flattened the back strap, peened it. Um, didn't do any of the fancy checkering, you know. It's already nickeled, so I'm not gonna go into doing that now. But I love this little gun, it's a great shooter. Um, wouldn't wanna change a thing on it. It works great for, for what I do. Um, leaving some of the components blued uh, really makes it pop. So, uh, it's a nice, it's a nice finish, good looking finish. And you can also, you know, you can beat blast portions, leave other portions uh, with a more shiny finish, brushed finish. Um, on the uh, 1911 government model we're gonna work on, I am just going to beat blast the in, entire gun. I'm not gonna do any differentiation in the finish from the slab sides to the, you know, the um, anterior, posterior of the gun. So uh, we'll move on. So we've uh, taped off the areas we don't want to hit. I just use a couple of tools and that is a razor, nice sharp razor, uh, popsicle stick, pair of scissors, and I have a old firing pin here I use to push the material to assist in that along with the popsicle stick to push it into the rail. And we now have taped off where we do not want to create the rough surface that you get with the bead blasting. I have left the little rubber plugs in here uh, where the grip screws are located and I did that because sometimes these glass beads work into the threads and they could be a bear to get out. And no matter how much you think you've gotten them out, you've cleaned it, you've washed it and scrubbed it, you start turning a screw in and you hear the grinding of the little, the little glass beads in there. So we are now ready to blast. All right, so our bead blasting is complete. And you'll see here that there were no major scratches on this that made it necessary for me to chase with uh, some meloxite paper. And like I said, this is just going to be totally a matte finish. I'm not going to polish the sides. So we'll get the tape off, make sure our rails look good. Okay, rails look good. As they should. Everything was taped off nicely. And we don't want to touch with uh, our bare hands. We'll get oil on the finish from your fingers. You don't want to do that, so I would suggest gloving up or even cotton gloves if you can get those. But uh, these uh, nitrile gloves work fantastic. Next step now is to replug all our holes where we don't want any plating to settle because these tolerances plating, the electrolytic nickel plating is a very slight buildup of material laying on to the surface, but it is very slight. If you were to leave this thing in the solution for hours and hours, which it's only a 30 to 40 minute process, you would begin building up material to the point where your parts are not going to fit anymore. And because we don't want any change in the tolerances of these pinholes here holding your hammer and your safety, you don't want to have to go in there with a file or a stone and start, start trying to move this stuff out. All right. 
and now it's plugging and e-nickeling. All right, so we're back. We've gotten our plugs reinstalled. We're ready to go. Um, this is the e-nickel solution. I've already got my mixture here in a uh, glass dish and I tested the glass dish to make sure I could heat it up to 190 and 200 degrees, which is our operating temperature for e-nickeling. Uh, you need a good thermometer. This is a candy thermometer, and uh, you wanna be able to make sure that your solution is maintained around 190 degrees, plus or minus five degrees for approximately 30 to 40 minutes because I don't know how much strength I might have lost over the years. I'm gonna do the full 40 minutes, maybe even 45, um, because if I have to do anything with the rails, uh, should there be a little buildup, it would virtually just be some very light honing. Um, a lot of times you don't have to use the plugs uh, when you're just doing a e-nickel finish standard 30 to 40 minute because the buildup only occurs where you can have the liquid flowing and so I'm gonna do that by agitating it a little bit stirring it around while the part is in there uh, get halfway through and then flip it over so uh, I'm just doing it as a precaution should there be any buildup I don't want to take more time getting in there those holes don't need to be plated you're gonna have your oiled parts in there and they're not gonna be e nickeled as well so there's no buildup on them so it should not be a problem so now we're just waiting for us to heat up to the 190 degrees once we get that we're gonna warm up our gun our, our uh, 1911 part also put it at about 90 degrees in the oven just to get it warmed up a little bit so it's not going in there cold and cooling the solution substantially. So once we get there, we'll come back to it. All right, so we've got our solution at about 180 degrees, 185 right now. Uh, we're just letting that maintain there until we get our part in here up to about 105 degrees. I'm going to let that stay in there for about another six, seven minutes. And my wife was graceful enough to let me use her expensive little cooker she has here. Hey, look, it even comes in handy for uh, gun parts. All right, so we're into 105 degrees. The plug should be fine. Come back to you when we're ready to put the part in. Okay, our frame is now in the solution, and we're gonna start timing that out to 40 minutes. After we get back up to temperature, we're just at about 195 degrees. Once we hit the 200 degree mark, I'm gonna set the timer for 40 minutes and agitate the solution once in a while. It's just making sure that the solution's moving. About halfway through, I'll flip the part over just so anything that might be sitting at the bottom of the glass has a chance to also plate because you need that agitation to complete the plating process. All right, see you then. So, I've flipped the part over. We're about halfway through the process. We're maintaining just about 200 degrees, between 195, 200 degrees. You can see the reaction has slowed down quite a bit. And that's when you know your plating is starting to get full coverage because you're gonna not see so much of the bubbling and foaming. And I do come in here with tongs and occasionally agitate 
a little bit. Uh, you need that agitation to get a good even coating. And it looks like I've lost a plug, so so be it. Um, we really shouldn't be putting enough plating on it that it should affect the fit of the pins. But if it does, we got a little honing file. We can go in there and touch that hole a little bit. So I'll see you when the process is done here. So now we've got the cold rinse for two minutes and we have our completed frame. Everything looks good. If you remember the shiny feed ramp is really not as shiny anymore. It's hard to get that in there and get a good look. But that shows you that there is a coating on it. And you can also see when you look close at the uh, grip screw hole, you can see the discoloration. You can see the original color of the steel that was there. So that's our finished product. Now, what I am going to do, I'm going to put this into the oven at 400 degrees for four to five hours. We'll split it four and a half hours. And that's going to harden this finish, make it a bit more resilient and a little less prone to scratching. And we'll be ready to assemble the gun. Okay, we'll get her in the oven.